I would like to thank all of our alums, current students, and prospective students uh, and their families for attending tonight. I hope you find tonight's presentation interesting and that you get to talk with one another uh, after the presentation. Uh, many alums and current students are veterans of Take It or Burke Society events, and you may find tonight's topic, Aztec Human Sacrifice, though perhaps morbidly fascinating, somewhat esoteric and removed from our present realities. Most previous Take It or Burke Society events were closely tied with current issues and clearly demonstrated uh, the how the past has shaped the present and the importance of studying history for understanding our current world. But what about Aztec religion and human sacrifice? Why give a talk on a topic so removed from us in place and time? Let me offer two, justific two justifications for tonight's talk. First, the topic is just, just simply fascinating. Um, although many civilizations have practiced human sacrifice, it appears that the Aztecs performed it on a larger scale than any other society. Why was that the case? What motivated them to do so? What was it about Aztec society and culture that sustained such extensive performance of human sacrifice? Such questions of causation are the foundation of historical research and so are worthy of consideration, especially about such an intriguing topic. Second, Although seemingly distant in place and time from us today, Aztec religion and human sacrifice have profoundly shaped the world in which we live, though the connection between them takes some explanation. In short, we are living in a world shaped by the legacy of Aztec human sacrifice, or to be more precise, in a world shaped by the legacy of early European accounts of Aztec human sacrifice. So let me begin there. These early European accounts were written by Spanish conquerors who came to Mexico to claim the land and by Spanish priests who came to convert the indigenous populations to Catholicism. Both groups were horrified by uh, human sacrifice and depicted it as cruel, bloody, and diabolical. Some of the most memorable accounts were penned by Bernard Diaz del Castillo, one of the common adventurers who participated in Hernando Cortez's uh, conquest of the Aztec Empire from 1519 to 1521. Uh, Diaz wrote a lengthy and engaging in, uh, tale entitled The True History of the Conquest of Mexico in his latter years. Uh, it was the most widely read account in the Spanish Aztec encounter um, at the time, and it was a bestseller in the early modern period and is still read today. Describing the final siege of the Aztec capital Tenochtitlan in the summer of 1521 and the pitched battles that raged between the Aztecs on the one hand and a small group of Spaniards and their very numerous indigenous allies on the other, Diaz recounts a Spanish defeat. As we were retreating, we heard the sound of trumpets from the great temple and also a drum, a most dismal sound indeed it was like an instrument of demons, as it resounded so that one could hear it two leagues off. At that moment, as we afterwards learned, they were offering the hearts of 10 of our comrades in much blood to the idols. And after another Spanish defeat, during which the Aztecs captured over 50 Spaniards, Diaz writes, again, there was sound of the dismal drum and many other shells and horns, and the sound of them was all terrifying. And we looked towards the lofty temple and saw that our comrades whom they had had captured were being carried by force up the steps and they were taking them to be sacrificed. When they got them up to the small oratory where their cursed idols are kept, we saw them place plumes on their heads with things like fans in their hands and they forced them to dance. And after they had danced, they immediately placed them on their backs. And with stone knives, they sawed open their chests and drew out their palpitating hearts and offered them to the idols. And they kicked the bodies down the steps and Indian butchers who were waiting below cut off the arms and feet and flayed the skin off the faces and prepared it afterward like glove, le glove leather and kept those for festivals when they celebrated drunken orgies and the flesh they ate. Diaz's depiction of Aztec human sacrifice as demonic, Aztec gods and idols as bloodthirsty, and Aztec culture as cannibalistic 
was widely shared among uh, other Spanish writers. One of the most widely read was Diego Duran, a Dominican friar who wrote a lengthy account of Aztec history in the mid 1500s. Writing about the dedication of the great temple or Coatepec, which we'll learn about later, he claims that the Aztecs sacrificed over 80,000 captives in four days. He writes, prisoners from the lines began to mount the steps and four lords assisted by priests who held the wretches to die by their feet and hands began to kill. They opened the chests of the victims, pulled out the hearts and offered them to the idols and to the sun. When the sovereigns grew weary, their satanic work was carried on by the priests who represented the gods. The streams of blood that ran down the steps of the temple were so great that they formed large fat clots, enough to terrify. Many priests went about gathering this blood in large gourds, taking it to the body of temples where they smeared walls and thresholds. The stench was unbearable. These portrayals of Aztec religion as satanic had real world effects. In short, they became the justification for Spanish colonization of the Americas, subjugating the indigenous populations to Spanish labor demands and converting the indigenous peoples to Catholicism. I'll just give one example, although there are a lot of them. Um, in, the fifth, in 1550, the Spanish crown sponsored a debate over the morality and the legality of Spanish conquest in the New World. Uh, this debate occurred in the city of Salamanca. The Spanish humanist Juan Gines de Sepulveda defended Spanish colonization. He gave many justifications, mostly based on Aristotle's classification of some people as natural slaves. His argument culminated in his character characterization of indigenous religions. He wrote, We have not yet spoken of their impious religion and of the wicked sacrifices in which they worship the devil as their god believing that they could offer no better tribute than human hearts. How can we doubt that these people, so uncivilized, so barbarous, contaminated with so many infidelities and vices, have been justly conquered? Sepulveda so does two things here. Most obviously, he portrays Aztec religion as satanic and declares that as a justification for conquest and subjugation. Less obviously, uh, he extends the characterization of satanic Aztec religion to all indigenous civilizations in the Americas. In short, he has justified all Spanish conquests in the New World because of Aztec human sacrifice. Now, unless we think that this justification of colonization uh, based on Aztec religion as satanic just happened among the Spaniards, uh, we need to know that English settlers Puritan preachers also justified their colonial projects in what became the U.S. by borrowing descriptions of indigenous religion as satanic, first elaborated by the Spaniards. I don't have time tonight to go into those, but there are lots and lots of examples of that. So, Aztec religion and human sacrifice are connected to our world today. European depictions uh, of them as cruel and satanic served as justifications for European conquest and colonization of the new world, the new world in which we live. Now that we've established that the topic of Aztec religion is relevant and important, we can turn to the question of why the Aztecs practice human sacrifice on such a grand scale. But before we get to that, we need to establish some context. Uh, the Aztec Empire was relatively young when it fell to Spanish conquerors uh, and rebellious indigenous city-states in 1521. In fact, the Aztecs began to build their empire uh, only in 1428 when they allied themselves with nearby with the nearby city-states of Texcoco and Tlacopan. Uh, also, the Aztecs were inheritors of cultural and technological developments of early, me, earlier Mesoamerican civilizations, including the practices of sedentary agriculture, calendrical timekeeping, pyramid building, and human sacrifice, uh, though they would elaborate on these and especially uh, the ritual practice of human sacrifice. 
Before the Aztecs established their empire, which we see here, uh, they were a nomadic people from modern day Northwestern Mexico. Eventually they migrated southward uh, and uh, entered the Valley of Mexico sometime around the year 1200. Now this stone monument depicts mythical elements of the Aztec migration story. The myth is that the Aztecs, the Aztecs tribal divinity war god who's uh, also conflated with the sun god, which is little Pochli, uh, or hummingbird on the left, promised the nomadic Aztecs that they would become a great nation and rule over others. He would guide them to a sacred site from which they would extend their dominion. This site for their capital would be revealed by the sign of an eagle perched on a cactus eating a snake. And you probably will recognize that image or something very similar to that uh, is the central image of the modern day flag for Mexico. The site they found uh, they found that site in the Valley of Mexico and would eventually build their city-state of Tenochtitlan right there on an island uh, in the center of the lake world. But when the Aztecs first arrived in the Valley of Mexico, they were a powerless nomadic people. They were forced to become mercenaries uh, for the two most powerful city-states uh, in the lake world at that time, Atzcapotzalco there and Culhuacan there. Uh, for their military services, the Aztecs were granted an undesirable swampy island in Lake Texcoco, right there, um, in about 1325 as their homeland. From this humble beginnings is when the Aztecs began to slowly build their empire. An imperial expansion began in 1428 with the foundation of the Triple Alliance. Again, that is Tenochtitlan. Texcoco and Tlacopan. It was uh, of the Triple Alliance. They attacked the most powerful city state at that time in the Lake World, that's Capotzalco, and conquered it. From there, the Aztec Empire began to grow, but it was a methodical uh, conquest, defeating one city state at a time. And you can see here the expansion of the Aztec Empire uh, by different Aztec emperors. And you can see that it was a piecemeal process and that it was continuing until the Spaniards arrived in 1519. This is uh, an image of the gladiatorial stone of Moctezuma I. And I show this image for a couple of reasons. And I'm going to focus in here. There. Uh, it depicts Mike de Quizoma's victories over individual city-states, in fact, 11 of them. Um, if we focus in on the front two panels, uh, we can see Mike de Quizoma represented here and here as holding the forelock of an opposing ruler there and there. The significance of that gesture as a sign of victory and defeat will become clear later. What also becomes apparent here is the is Aztec military strategy. The warrior's goal was not to kill enemies on the battlefield, but to take them captive. And these captives were the main source of victims for human sacrifice and reveals that war and religion were intimately linked in Aztec culture. Now, with that background that we have, we can turn to why the Aztecs practice human sacrifice. The first pillar that we need to understand uh, this ritual practice is the Aztecs cosmology or worldview. How did the Aztecs understand the origins, purpose, and destiny of the cosmos? Two elements of this worldview are particularly important. One is that the Aztecs believed they lived in the era that they believed they 
believe that they lived in the fifth era of the cosmos. And the other has to do with how that fifth era or sun came into being. The Aztec sunstone seen here uh, depicts the five eras or suns of the universe. Here is represented for Jaguar. It lasted 676 years and came to an end when ocelots devoured all human beings. This represents for wind. It lasted 364 years and came to a calamitous end when raging winds destroyed everything and turned humans into monkeys. This square represents for rain, which lasted 312 years. It ended in a rain of fire. And at the end of this sun, human beings turned into monkeys. The last square represents for water, and it lasted 676 years, but came to an end when water swallowed everything and human beings turned to fish. The fifth age of the cosmos, or for movement, is represented by the center circle. And just like the other ages, the Aztecs knew that this would end in calamity. For movement meant that the age would end in catastrophic movement or tremendous earthquakes. The other thing to notice about uh, this image is that it has... Uh, in the center, a representation of Tonantiu, the Aztec sun god. The other reason why this fifth age was called for movement is because in this age, the sun moved in an orderly fashion across the sky. I just wanted to point out that in this image of Tonantiu, he has an obsidian sacrificial blade coming out of his mouth as a tongue, and he has two claws here, each one holding a stylized uh, representation of a human heart. The other thing that's important to uh, notice about this particular image of the Aztec sunstone are these rings of uh, squares here. Uh, there are 20 of them, and they represent the 20 Aztec day signs. Uh, the Aztecs had two calendars. One was a solar calendar of 365 days, which was composed of 18 months of 20 days with five inauspicious dead days at the end of the year. And the other calendar was a ritual calendar of 260 days composed of 13 months of 20 days. Day one, month one of the solar calendar and day one, month one of the ritual calendar met up once every 52 years. And 52 uh, is essentially, 52 years is an Aztec calendar round or more or less an Aztec century. One thing to notice is that all of those four previous ages lasted multiples of 52 years. And this is one of the pillars of Aztec human sacrifice. The Aztecs knew that their era for movement here in the center would come to an end in calamity just like the other four ages and at the end of a calendar round. They didn't know when, and somehow human sacrifice with hearts was linked to that notion. Another component of the Aztec world of view that helps explain human sacrifice is the sacred story about the creation of the fifth sun or that last era uh, for movement. The gods gathered at Teotihuacan, uh, Teotihuacan was actually a classic uh, Mesoamerican site that had been long abandoned before the Aztecs migrated uh, into central Mexico, uh, but it was the largest uh, city in the classic world, and the Aztecs certainly knew about it. In fact, Teotihuacan comes from Nahuatl, or the language of the Aztecs, and it means abode of the gods, and it served as the mythical birthplace of the uh, Fifth Age. 
the gods at the end of the fourth age gathered at uh, Teotihuacan and sat around a fire for warmth because the sun did not exist. And they decided that after much contemplation, that one god would need to sacrifice himself by leaping into the fire to create a new sun. And they chose Tecatl, who attempted four times to leap into the fire, but lost his courage each time. At that point, the gods chose Nanawatsin, which means covered by sores. He was a humble, uh, humble divinity. And he summoned his courage and leapt into the fire. And although after a long wait, the sun eventually rose in the east, it did not move across the sky. It simply wobbled back and forth. Therefore, the gods decided that they must all jump into the fire for the sun to move in an orderly fashion across the sky. So one by one they did, but still the sun did not move. And the one remaining god, Eekato, the wind god, had to exert himself to blow the sun across the sky. We learn from this story that the sacri that sacrifice is necessary for creation and life. The gods were willing to sacrifice themselves to renew the cosmos. We also learn that creating life and sustaining order in the world, or the orderly movement of the sun across the sky, requires much sacrifice and effort. The sun does not simply move on its own. It requires sacrifice, indeed much sacrifice. If the gods were willing to sacrifice themselves to create the world, shouldn't humans be willing to sacrifice to maintain life and an orderly movement of the sun? These two ideas, the knowledge of the fifth age would end in calamity and that sustaining life required sacrifice, came together most clearly in a ritual called the new fire ceremony. This ceremony occurred every 52 years at the end of one calendar round and the beginning of another. At the end of one calendar round, uh, it was exactly when the Aztecs were most fearful that the cosmos would collapse in violent movements. On the last day of that calendar round, all fires in Tenochtitlan were extinguished and people broke their pottery vessels in anticipation of the end of the world. Priests would parade a sacrificial victim ceremoniously dressed through the city and ascend a hilltop. There they waited for nightfall. At night, they watched the Pleiades move across the sky. Once it passed the meridian, it became clear to everyone that the fifth age would last one more calendar run. The priest then immediately sought open the victim's chest, removed the heart, and kindled a fire in the chest cavity. Runners then took the fire to the great temple in the center of Tenochtitlan, where they lit it before, uh, where they lit a fire before, which was a pochli. From there, the fire was distributed to the rest of the city. Human sacrifice had sustained life, preserved the fifth sun, just as the gods had recreated the world at Teotihuacan. So now we know why the Aztecs practiced human sacrifice. It maintained the world in existence and sustained life. But we still have to question why they performed human sacrifice the way they did, which is mostly by ripping out human hearts of captured warriors. We need to consider two other aspects of the Aztec worldview to understand sacrifice through heart excision. First, we need to explore how the Aztecs conceived of the human body. It is a receptacle of divine forces which for lack of a better translation, I'll just call, uh, I'll just call souls. The Aztecs believed that the body housed three divine uh, forces or souls, the Iyoto, the Tonai, and the Tayoria. The Iyoto is the least important soul for understanding human sacrifice. Uh, the Iyoto was a luminous gas that resided in the liver. It could be used to cast spells and control aspects of the natural world. And here we see Miklantikuli, uh, the Lord of the Dead, 
in skeletal form. His liver right there protrudes below his rib cage and is split open, releasing the iyoto. The tonai was divine heat that resided in the skull. Ometeoto, the great creator god and lord of duality from which all existence springs, implanted this divine heat into the fetus while it was in the womb. This divine force determined one's destiny and could be increased through acts of great valor like capturing opposing warriors in battle or artistic creativity. Because it resided in the skull, it imbued the hair and thus uh, the forelock and scalp were great trophies in war. Thinking back to uh, the uh, gladiatorial stone of Mate Kutsoma the first, he is shown as a sign of, in a sign of victory holding the forelock of opposing defeated foes. The Tonai could not only increase during life through acts of great valor and artistry, it could also be accumulated in death. And here we have uh, the great skull rack of uh, the great temple of Tenochtitlan. Skull rack is Zongpatli. The Aztecs often decapitated sacrificial victims, uh, though captured warriors uh, had increased who had increased their uh, uh, tonai so that Tenochtitlan uh, would benefit from this accumulated sacred power. Last, the Toyolia, or divine fire, uh, was a sacred force that animated human beings and gave them intelligence. It resided in the heart. Upon death, the Toyolia ascended to the celestial realm of the dead or the sky of the sun and was transformed into birds. And this is key for the transformed Toyolia could serve as sustenance for the gods. Those gods who had sacrificed themselves to recreate life. And here we have a chakmul, um, or a sacrificial receptacle from the great, great temple. Uh, this one stood before the temple of Tlaloc, the rain god, also a fertility god. Uh, many times, hidden uh, hearts, uh, would be placed in the bowls of these images uh, to feed the gods. So now we know why uh, the Aztecs used human heart excision uh, to as a form of human sacrifice, because it was the uh, housing for Teolia, and the Teolia was what was needed to feed and sustain and nourish the gods. The second as aspect of the worldview that we need to explore to understand why they ripped hearts uh, from the chest of captured warriors involves the myth of Coatepec, or Serpent Mountain. This myth also speaks uh, to the relationship between the sun on the one hand and the moon and the stars on the other. And this myth begins with Coatepec. Uh, Koalikwe is a mother goddess and fertility goddess, uh, and Koalikwe means uh, Our Lady of the Serpent Skirt, and you can always sell images of Koalikwe because she literally will have a skirt of serpents, uh, which you can see here. In this image, she's wearing a necklace of human hands and hearts and a belt with a human skull as a buckle. And the story goes that Koalikwe uh, was on Serpent Mountain, or Coatepec, uh, sweeping, when a ball of feathers drifted down the air towards her. And she grabbed the ball of feathers and placed it in her blouse uh, by her breast. Lo and behold, she became pregnant. Her daughter, Koyoshauki, the moon goddess, hears of this and becomes infuriated at the shame that her mother, Koalikwe, had brought upon uh, herself. Koyo Shelki rallies her 400 siblings, her brothers, to march upon Coatepec to slay her mother. Once they arrive arrayed for war, 
which is unfortunately the Aztec tribal god, war god, and often conflated with the sun god, bursts from his mother's womb, fully adult and fully armed. He kills his 400 brothers and his sister, and he reserves special treatment for Koyoshelki, the leader of the murderous plot. He dismembers her and kicks her body down Coatepec or Serpent Mountain. Here is a stone image of Koyoshelki found at the base of the Great Temple in Tenochtitlan, Mexico City. As you can see, she is decapitated and dismembered. Here is a model of the sacred center of Tenochtitlan. Though the city itself was much larger, this is just uh, the, the, the ceremonial center where the Great Pyramid uh, resided. Uh, and this is the Great Temple right here. It has two uh, oratories or shrines at the top of it, one for Tlaloc, a rain and fertility god, and the other for which is Pochli, the sun uh, god, tribal divinity, and war god. The uh, disc that represented Koyoshalki was here at the base of the pyramid. Here's what remains of the great temple um, in modern day Mexico City. The army that conquered Tenochtitlan in the summer of 1521, again, a group of only about a thousand Spaniards and tens of thousands of uh, indigenous warriors from subject city states to the Aztec Empire, had to level Tenochtitlan house by house and block by block because the Aztecs refused to surrender until starvation and uh, thirst crippled their resistance. After the conquest, the Spaniards dismantled uh, the remaining pyramids to use the stone for construction of uh, their capital, Mexico City, literally on the top of the Aztec ruins. This is the serpent sculpture at the base of the Great Temple, or as it's known in Nahuatl, language of the Aztecs, Coatepec. Serpent Mountain. We quite literally have a serpent here. Also close to this at the base of the temple was that stone effigy of the dismembered Koyoshauki. So why did the Aztecs sacrifice captured warriors through heart excision on the top of pyramids? Because they were enacting the sacred story of Coatepec. The sacrifices represented the victory of Huitzilopochtli, the sun god, over Koyoshauki, the moon goddess, and her 400 brothers who represented the stars. After priests removed the victim's heart, the seat of the Toyolia, and offered it to the gods to provide them the sustenance necessary to continue uh, creation, the movement of the sun across the sky and life in general, they kicked the defeated foes down the pyramid stairs where others waited below to dismember the bodies, just as Wichelopochli had done to his sister Koyoshauki. In short, each sacrifice recreated the sun's victory over the forces of night. Last. It's important to note that Spanish chroniclers vastly overstated the prevalence of Aztec human sacrifice. Yes, the Aztecs did regularly sacrifice captives uh, and sometimes others, but not nearly on the scale as depicted by Spaniards like Diego Duran, who stated that they killed over 80,000 victims in four days to dedicate, to dedicate the Great Temple. No archaeological excavation, and the Mexican state has funded uh, numerous uh, excavations has found anything approaching even one half of 1% of that number. And if we consider one more aspect of Aztec religion, the role of the Ashipla, or God impersonator, this becomes obvious. Aztec human sacrifice was not an industrial assembly line or a de-assembly line, 
Uh, the actual sacrificial moment was the culmination of a much lengthier ritual process that could last days, weeks, months, and in the case of the most solemn festival, uh, an entire year. This most solemn festival I'll use as an example. Uh, it was uh, the Feast of Toshkatl. It occurred in May at the end of the dry season, just before the rainy season begins in central Mexico. In that ritual month, uh, the Aztecs held a feast of Toshkato, which means dry season, in honor of one of their great creator gods, Tezcatlipoca, or Lord of the Smoking Mirror. Tezcatlipoca is actually uh, the god who ruled over the first of the four, first of the five sons. A year before the festival began, a captive warrior without blemish was chosen to become Tezcatlipoca's Eshipla, or human manifestation. He was ritually bathed to remove impurities, clothed in ritual garments, and, feather head, and a feather headdress of Tezcatlipoca, and taught to perform ritual dances and songs also associated with Tezcatlipoca. He was treated as Tezcatlipoca for the entire year, honored in public and accompanied by eight attendants. In the last 20 days of the year, in a sign of fertility of the coming rain season, he was uh, wed to four women who had also prepared for the ritual the entire year. Here we have an image of the Eshipla, or God manifestation in a human of Tezcatlipoca, uh, accompanied by his four wives and by uh, his attendants. They had prepared the entire year. The sacrificial event was only a brief moment in this prolonged ritual. Now, not all victims had such extended stints as a sheep left, but this ritual phase that absorbed time, effort, and wealth occurred during all Aztec sacrifices, or as part of all Aztec sacrifices. Because victims first became a sheep left, it's clear that the Aztecs did not mindlessly sacrifice hundreds or even dozens of humans per day. Sacrifice rather was a lengthy, costly, and carefully orchestrated ritual process. In conclusion, uh, human sacrifice was a ritual that reflected and reinforced the Aztec worldview. A ritual, as a ritual, sacrifice recalled and reenacted sacred stories, just like the ritual, just like rituals in all religions do. Yes, early Spanish accounts portrayed Aztec sacrifice as cruel, satanic, and constant, but these writers exaggerated, demonized, and clearly did not understand Aztec religion. Also, to finish, I want to highlight two ironies of the Spanish of these early Spanish depictions. First, rather than cruel and sadistic, the purpose of Aztec human sacrifice was to sustain life by nourishing the gods and repaying them for their own sacrifices to create the cosmos. Because death and sacrifice brought life, human sacrifice was a moral obligation. Lastly, Spanish representations of Aztec religion as satanic served to justify Spanish and later uh, European conquest and colonization of the New World. Many more indigenous people died during wars of conquest and as a result of labor demands than the Aztecs ever sacrificed to maintain and sustain the cosmos.